Okay. Uh, hi, Gunnar. Um, so next week there's the Nobel banquet and everything, and the physics prize is going to the LIGO project and uh, that have detected gravitational waves. And uh, as I understood it, you've been uh, doing some presentations on the LIGO projects and you have some connections to it yourself as well. Um, how, could you tell us a little bit about how it started? Like, what is a gravitational wave? Uh, well, if it's, it's a bit funny that uh, it's so difficult to uh, detect gravitational waves, given that gravity is probably the force we are most familiar with. We have all, all dropped the glass into the floor or stumbled or uh, uh, seen something fall down and so on. Uh, yet, uh, gravity is a very, very weak force. But basically, uh, gravitational waves are not so difficult to explain. If you imagine that you have a massive, big, say, star somewhere, then, of course, this star will have a gravitational pull on you. That is, the gravitational field will have a little component in that direction. Okay? Say now this star is located far, far away, say a billion light years away, okay? And then, for some reason, the star shifts position, or it explodes, so that the mass is redistributed. Then, of course, the gravitational field or gravitational pull will be a diff different if the star is there or if the star is there. However, Einstein, when developing his uh, theory of relativity, he realized that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And if something is then a billion light years away, it means that we will not, s we have, there's absolutely no way we can know that the star has moved until in a billion years, okay? Only then we will perceive that the gravitational field shifted. Yeah. Yeah. So not even the gravitational waves can travel faster than no. the speed of light, even though it's this space-time itself that's moving. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. No. This is this is a simplistic way of just understanding why gravitational waves exist at all. And if if this mass now would be say oscillating back and forth, then of course what we would see is an oscillating gravitational field. And this is basically gravitational waves. But of course, Einstein had a more sophisticated uh, explanation where he shows that space itself is curved by gravity, okay? But I think in a, in, in a simple explanation, I think everyone can understand why there should be gravitational waves simply based on the premises that nothing can move faster than light. And the reason, because they are very weak, these gravitational waves, when they reach us, and that's maybe connected to that they are so far away, and the gravitational waves as other waves spread in all directions, or how the, does that work? Yeah, this, this is correct. So like uh, any radiating wave, uh, the intensity is proportional to the distance, in, inverse distance squared. And if something is far away, then the, the, this is going to be extremely weak. This is correct. And do you know how weak it is? Uh, no, I don't. I know how high or I read something about high, how high precision you need in these measurements. Yeah. Uh, something like 10 to the power of minus 17, or uh, even right? even even lower or, or more than that. Uh -huh. So what what the gravitational wave does is to Earth, for instance, is that it sets Earth in a sort of motion. Okay, so it's compressed in one direction and then ex expands in another direction, and then it goes back and forth like this when the wave passes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then the the kind of um, uh, measure one uses is the strain. That is the the uh, how much the the Earth uh, widens in a, in in a direction divided by the the width. Okay, so the relative mm -hmm. length. Okay. Yeah. And the relative lengths one has to measure are on the order of, as you say, 10, 10 to the minus 17. This is not so high, but LIGO actually achieves almost 10 to the minus 21. And I would say that the, the events they have seen are in the order of 10 to the minus 20. Okay, and th this, is, this is totally mind-boggling because if you translate it to some physical distance, yeah. say you take the distance between Beijing and Shanghai, that is roughly a thousand kilometers, okay, as the crow flies. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so this is 10 to the 6 meters. Okay, and then you have to measure that with a precision of 10 to the minus 20. That is, you must measure it with the absolute length precision of 10 to the minus 14. Meters. Okay, <laughs> and this is so small that it's hard to comprehend. So we can compare it to something we at least maybe have a, some idea about. And this is a hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. So the radius of a hydrogen atom is on the order of 10 to the minus 10. Okay. So it means that you have to, to measure the distance from Shanghai to Beijing, or conversely, with an absolute precision of a, a ten thousandth of a hydrogen atom diameter or radius. So that's like a nucleus of an atom, then, or something like that, uh, or the, uh, the it, neutron. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it certainly is smaller than the smallest atom we have. Yeah. Much smaller. Yes. Yes. Oh. Yes. And um, so how? Uh, I, because Einstein expressed at some point that he thought that we would never be able to measure these. Yes. But now we are. Yeah. So there was, uh, there must have been someone who actually believed that we could measure them. Yes, yes. Uh, there have been a few persons, perhaps the most uh, known one, uh, his name was Weber, mm -hmm. and uh, he became obsessed with measuring the gravitational wave. He was the first one, I think, to really take it seriously. He believed that he would be able to measure gravitational waves. Uh, so what he invented was a method of doing it, and his idea was the following. So you take a big metal cylinder. In his case, he took a piece of aluminum, about a meter long and a meter in diameter. So it's, it's a few tons of metal. And of course, when a gravitational wave passes, this also compresses and expands. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the point is that if you make this uh, metal piece uh, suspended in a way so it, it's not, uh, how should I say, mechanically damped so much, it, it continues to ring, so to speak. It's like if you would knock on the metal, it would, it would vibrate for a long time. Okay. Yeah. In that way, he had a long time to, to do the measurement. Uh, and the reason he want, or needed a long time is that the way he would measure the def deformation of this aluminum cylinder was that he put piezoelectric uh, transducers on them. So the piezoelectricity works such that if you, if you stretch or compress a piezoelectric material, then you generate the voltage over the material. And mm -hmm. then you feed that into an amplifier because it's a tiny signal. And that way you can see if it stretches or compresses. But the problem is that when the whole space-time does that, you get no signal. And this is why you need this ringing that, that, that it continues, because when the gravitational wave has passed, the aluminum piece is still doing this, and then you can record it, okay? But how small, uh, how small uh, changes can this piece electric piece? Uh, well, again, now, <laughs> now we don't measure the distance between Beijing and Shanghai. We measure the distance over one meter. Yeah. So now it has to be uh, a million times more sensitive to reach the same sensitivity, if you would have the same. And this was, of course, Weber's uh, problem, that uh, his method was relatively unsensitive. And moreover, uh, you can imagine that such a big block of metal, if you keep it at room temperature, it's going to uh, move by thermal motion. Yeah. So uh, at least towards the end of his experimental career with the gravitational wave, he tried also to cool it. So he put it in a, in a duar, a thermos bottle, mm -hmm. and then cooled it to reduce the, the thermal motions of the, of the metal itself. And I, I can tell you a, a funny story. So my first encounter uh, with actual gravitational wave detection was when I was a student. So when I was a master's student, then in 1983, we did a study trip to China. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, we visited several universities and Acta Sinica facilities. And one of the universities we went to, I believe it was Fudan University in Shanghai. When we entered one of the physics uh, experimental halls, there was a Weber bar antenna. And I think that I was the only one of the students who knew what this was at the time. So. 
And then they explain to us about gravitational waves and how they would detect this and so on. And the, the whole thing was inside a big duar. And then I, after collecting my courage, I, 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 I asked the question, so when do you believe you will detect your first gravitational wave? <laughs> And the answer was, oh, no, we will never do that. <laughs> and then I asked, but, but, but why? And they said, well, simply because we, at least for the foreseeable future, cannot afford to cool it down. Because if you want to cool down <laughs> several tons of metal, yeah. it's very, very costly. And at that time, China was a relatively poor country, not as prosperous as, as it is today. So simply, the department didn't have the budget for it. <laughs> okay. But they developed a technique, and, and it was an impressive piece of uh, scientific uh, equipment. But, so I just felt sorry for my Chinese colleagues who could not really use it in the best way uh, it was intended for. Uh, but they yeah. can maybe learn from it. Anyway. Yeah, uh, we will come to that, I think, uh, uh, later on, because uh, it is also so with, with newer uh, gravitational wave antennas that they are built, although we more or less know that they will not detect anything. And, this is simply the only way to learn. There are so many things that possibly can go wrong or things you have not thought about that if you don't try them, you will never discover. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then uh, eventually there was other ideas on how one could measure this that led up well, to... What, 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 what happened first was that Weber, he actually claimed that he had detected a gravitational wave. Uh -huh. So he published, so he had just like the present gravitational wave detectors, you must, you cannot only have one because they are so noisy and they record so much of the seismic activity, earthquakes and waves uh, crashing against the shores and so on. So you, you get lots of signal all the time. Mm. So how do you know it's a gravitational wave? Well, what you do is you take two of these and you place them far apart. And then you run and look at the signal in coincidence. And all the seismic noise and so on, you can calculate how much uh, time displacement it should have. We know the seismic waves pretty well by now. Yeah. Uh, and you can also calculate for different directions in the sky what the time difference would be for a gravitational wave. Mm. Okay? And that's actually how you can pinpoint which direction the wave came from in, in the sky. Uh, but anyhow, Weber, he claimed in, in the late 1970s that he had seen such an event. Uh, only one, though. Mm. Uh, and then there was a long debate uh, whether this was true or not, and several people tried to repeat his uh, experiment, and no one succeeded. So I think that consensus, more or less today, is that his, his sense, this must have been something else. And uh, the, the sensitivity of his instrument was, was simply too low to see these faint waves. Mm. But what was his motivation that, that this should be a gravitational wave more than that he had a signal? If you can get the signal from different kinds of... Well, if, 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 if you look for an unknown signal and all of a sudden you see something which matches your, your uh, ah. expectation, then what can you do? You have to make some interpretation. And, and his interpretation was that this really was a gravitational wave. And, and I guess we will never be sure. I mean, this is how, how science works. But if no one can repeat it, then likelihood that this was really a... a cosmic event is, of course, maybe not so high. Mm. But, but uh, the truth will yes. never be found. No. Yeah. But you, you mentioned now that he saw a signal that had some, because um, what do you say? today uh, one can predict kind of the, sh the shape of the signal, depending on what kind of yeah. object it is as well. Yeah. Yeah. Did they have that knowledge? No, no, then? no, no, no. I mean, in, in the 70s, everything was pretty primitive. Mm. He could, for instance, only save his signal, as far as I know, on paper. Okay, so he had the paper printout of, of, of some needle jumping, you know. Yeah, it's, so yeah, you could, you, could, you could look at them and say, well, they look pretty similar. Today, of course, the signals are, are saved on computers, and you can run lots of mathematical simulations. I, I, again, I think we'll come back today. How do you, today, how do you really uh, sort out the relevant signal from the noise? Yeah. Okay, and, and, and that's something we can do today that he really couldn't do uh, at, at all with the precision we can do today. Mm. Um, so uh, let's see what we can 
So, but uh, then after yeah, yeah, yeah. after this uh, controversy regarding his results, yeah. um, what, did that like raise the interest in this field and actually uh, trying to? Yes, it yes it did. But another thing happened that really uh, was detrimental. Uh, and uh, that is that one of the Nobel laureates now, uh, Weiss, he, um, this is again an interesting story, uh, he was uh, allegedly teaching a course in gravity and relativity. Uh, and he was, he was not uh, very good at it, so he had to read up on it. Uh, and then as an exercise for the students, as I'm told, he uh, thought that maybe you can measure gravitational wave by building interferometers, an interferometer instead of having a lump of metal, okay? Uh, so that you measure the distance between two free hanging mirrors, and they should also go like this if the gravitational wave is, is, is passing. Uh, he was not actually the first to, to suggest measuring gravitational waves by optics. There was a Russian team that did that earlier, but already actually in the 60s, but, but nothing happened there. But, but uh, Weiss, he did the, uh, what, what he did was that in addition to giving a fairly comprehensive blueprint to how you would build a gravitational wave interferometer based on uh, light, uh, he also analyzed the noise sources. So in, in his report that he eventually wrote, uh, he went through different kinds of noise sources and estimated how uh, strong they were and therefore what sensitivity you, you, you needed. And uh, some people picked up on this. Uh, the field was, was pretty calm for a while, uh, but eventually uh, people became serious about this and, and proposed to the National uh, Science uh, Foundation. Uh, to build such an interferometer. And you need to build them very large, so they become very expensive. So this is, of course, uh, 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 how should I say, uh, investing lots of money in something you don't know will work at all. Yeah. But a lot of science is like that. <laughs> yeah, but this was the, this is true, uh, especially these large facilities like like CERN or or Fermilab or or uh, Stanford Linear Accelerator and so on. Yeah, this is this is true, uh, but here it it's still a little bit different because this would be the first detector ever for gravitational wave. I mean, there is no predecessor. Uh, if you take the large colliders, we at least have had colliders in the past. We know that they are. Big. We don't know if we are going to see the Higgs boson, mm. but, but at least we know the technology and we know that in principle we know how to do it. But, but here it's, it's really getting into the unknown. Uh, okay. But even here, this, because the, the, um, the LIGO detector that they use now to measure these uh, gravitational waves, they are like second what do you say, generation? Yeah. No? yeah. That there was one before? Yeah. But even that one was. Uh, a large industry. Yeah, it, it was as large. So in, in fact, it's the same, it's the same, uh, how should I say, buildings, if I say so. The, 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 the large infrastructure is the same for the initial LIGO and the advanced LIGO, the one they detected the gravitational wave with. Yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, the, everything that goes on inside, uh, so the laser and the mirrors and uh, the, the vibration damping and so on. All this has been improved a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I must say I'm a little bit admiring the Americans who, who dared investing in this, more or less in, in knowing that at least in the first version it, it would not work. They would not detect anything. They didn't detect anything. And I think it, the, the, the initial line ran for something like eight years. Mm. And there was no depth detected gravitational wave. But during these eight years, they learned a lot. Really, many things that they had not maybe thought about, mm. uh, or s things that they realized they could do better by doing it in a different way. Yeah, but if we go back, so when was it that they built this first? One? It, it, it started in the early 2000s. Mm. Okay. 
Uh, and then it ran for, I think, until 2008. And then there was a period when it was shut down for rebuilding all these things that they have learned. And then it's, they restarted it in 2012 or so, mm -hmm. I think. And of course, they are continuously upgrading things. Uh, so it's not like they are running for three years without doing anything. So it's, it's constantly being up, up, upgraded. But, but the large upgrade from initial LIGO to advanced LIGO, it was around 2010. Mm. And uh, so there was quite a long time there, like the whole, from, from the time when uh, Weber published his results till yeah, they actually built the the LIGO, yeah, there was yeah. like 15 years or something, yeah, 20 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. So was that the time that it took for them to, to get the funding to do this? It, uh, well, partially it was because, of course, this is a large project involving many, many people, not only in the U United States, but also in uh, Europe and in uh, Japan and uh, now also in India and perhaps also in China. Mm -hmm. um, and during the, the time, patients almost ran out <laughs> uh, because uh, my understanding is that there was problem with the management of the whole uh, uh, project. And that's when one of the other laureates, Barry Barish, came in who was uh, originally an uh, elementary particle physics manager, so to speak. He had management experience from large facilities and was brought into this project specifically to coordinate and, and make everything coherent. And, and I can imagine that, that that must be difficult, especially since, since you don't know yeah. <laughs> if it's going to work or not. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I read something about that, that he was kind of the savior of the project somehow, because he, he even though the scientists were there before and they had all the knowledge about the science and all that drive, in the end, if you're gonna do this kind of project, you really have to, to work together and be structured and yeah. work towards a common yeah. goal. Like yeah, yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. this is true. So uh, let's then talk about how the actual instrument works. Uh, the yeah. LIGO is essentially a Michelson interferometer. That means that you have a half silvered <laughs> mirror. It's, it's not half silver, but it, it splits a beam 50-50. So some of the light goes this way, some of the light goes that way. And then you have mirrors, and the light bounces back and forth, and eventually comes back, and it interferes in, in the same mirror. And now if the relative lengths shifts in the two arms, then the light coming back will start not to come out of one port, it will shift to the other port, and this is one, one, what one is detecting. What is special with LIGO is that this interference is extremely long. Each arm is four kilometers. And moreover, you want as much light as possible coming back, so you cannot afford it scattering in air, for instance. Moreover, it would pick up turbulence and all kinds of things. So actually, in each arm, you have a steel uh, tube that you pump vacuum in. So LIGO is actually the world's second largest vacuum system. Hmm. Okay? Uh, there are 10,000 cubic meters of air to pump out. Uh, and it takes 40 days to get rid of the, the air to the extent you want. Okay, and um, then uh, the, 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 the interesting mass that you, you really want to move is the end, the end mirror. It is suspended on, in, in, on wires. So that's the object that's, that's then affected by the gravitational wave? Or the yeah, of course, the whole Earth is affected, but, yeah. but, but somehow the... the uh, the corner station is joint for both arms. Mm -hmm. So what you, what you measure is the relative distance between the corner station and, and this mirror and the corner station and that mirror. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, then, then you try to do everything you can to, first of all, boost the signal. So how do you do that? Uh, one way of doing it is to, as I said, let the light bounce back and forth many times. In that way, you effectively increase the arm length. So instead of being four kilometers, the arm length is effectively 300 times that because the, the, the light bounces back and forth 300 times before it exits. But how, okay, but how do you 
how do you get it to do that? Or how do you know that the light that you're getting out is the one that has bounced 300 times? Uh, the, 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 the 300 <laughs> times is a sort of statistics because actually yeah. it, it is a so-called resonator. So you have two mirrors uh. and the, the, the light bounces. So what, what you can say, how long time will it need to bounce before on average the, the light has left the system? And this yeah. is, this is a f roughly a factor of 300. And that increases the sensitivity. By. And then uh, one needs to have uh, a large intensity. Okay? So because you're coping this with a laser. What kind of laser do they have? Uh, it's, it's an amplified laser. So uh, actually, they start with ordinary semiconductor lasers. And with that, they pump a so-called ring laser, with, which has a different wavelength. And that laser is, is pretty standard. You could, in principle, find it in our lab. Uh, it gives only two watts. Okay, but then you amplify that in a special amplifier, so you get 35 watts. And now you understand, who have been working with this, that this is pretty much. Yeah. And then you amplify that, so that you get roughly uh, 200 watts, I think, uh, out. So this is a really, nice really strong... Yes, yes. <laughs> and then you resonate this, so inside, inside each arm is about 25 kilowatts <laughs> of yeah. light. Wow, and then uh, these, uh, that's what I find so fascinating, that, uh, so the light is so strong, so these mirrors must somehow, they must be able to handle this enormous energies. Yes. At the same time, it should be super sensitive to yes. tiny Tiny, changes. tiny, yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't so, know why. How does it happen? How does it so, well, it's, it, it, this is one of the things that simply doesn't just happen. Yeah. So, <laughs> so you have to make it happen. And, and this is one of the things uh, uh, that was worked on uh, already when, when the initial LIGO was built. So at that time, I was working for a brief time at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, the professors at Stanford, and uh, along with many others, they realized that the initial LIGO would not have the sensitivity to, to detect the gravitational wave. Mm -hmm. So somehow, uh, means had to be taken to increase the s sensitivity. And, and one of them was that, yeah, the power must go up somehow. Uh, and this power cannot be absorbed by the mirrors because then he heat up. And then you have the same problem as Weber, that they start to, to do thermal motion. So what one group at Stanford that was working close to me was doing was de developing uh, coatings, for extremely good mirror coatings. And another thing I know they've been doing, not at Stanford but elsewhere, is to uh, make extremely low absorbing glass. So whatever photons are not being reflected, uh, so they, they penetrate the coating anyhow, should not be absorbed by the glass that the mirror consists of. They just but pass it through. It should yeah. just pass through. Uh, so th th these are two things they, they, they work with, but, but still a little fraction is still absorbed by the mirror, and that makes the mirror deform a bit. And you don't want that, because that, makes, that increases the losses so that you don't get the 300 times uh, bouncing back and forth. You get less than that. Mm -hmm. And that is counteracting by putting additional lasers actually heating <laughs> the mirrors in other spots so that it retains its shape. Okay. So while the measurement is being done, they have a feedback system that keeps the shape of the mirrors t in order to uh, keep the light as long as they want in, in the interferometer arc. So this is one technique. There must be a lot of this kind of uh, adaptive... There, there are lots and lots of, yes, feedback loops and, 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 and measurements of different things. So the mirrors we're talking about are about this size. Yeah. They weigh 40 kilos each, the end mirrors. They are suspended in thin, thin, thin glass, glass fibers, fused fi silica fibers, only 0.3 millimeters in diameter. Okay, so you can imagine the sound, it would be ding. If you would <laughs> pluck it, it would have a very high sound. And over it is another mass. And over that is another mass. And over that is another mass. And they are all suspended. And then you wonder, why do they have such a four-stage system? Yeah. And the, the reason is, is not so difficult to understand. If, 
if a wave passes from a string to something which is heavy, then most of the energy in that wave is going to be reflected because the mass will not move. And by having different strings and different masses, you can reject waves with different frequencies. So this is a, a sort of a stage of gradually making the vibrations from the suspension of the mirrors less and less and less and less. Ah, so one, has, one puts the mirror in vacuum because yeah. the normal waves can't, or the, like, uh, what do you say, material waves or... or well, you put them in vacuum for two reasons. Yeah. The, 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 the one reason is to uh, isolate them uh, from, from ordinary sound. When I speak, I say, yeah, exactly. okay, but, but sound doesn't propagate in vacuum. There is no, uh, no gas to yeah. pro propagate no it. So, yeah. so, so to isolate the mirrors from, from ordinary sound, sound waves, uh, you want vacuum. But you want it also, as I said before, that you don't want the light to scatter. Oh, yeah. We think that air is very transparent, but, but air is in fact not completely transparent. But, so you have absorption and scattering, and you don't want that. Yeah. Mm? Okay. And then you do this second thing to isolate the mirror from, from uh, waves that go through the... Yeah, somehow you have to suspend it. Suspension. Yeah, yeah. so this is, this is the, essentially the earth moving. Yeah. Okay, and, and you don't want that. So, so it's somehow you have to hang it. And, and this... But this is not enough because actually they have two rows uh, next to each other of this, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, at least at some of the stages, you also have feedback. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so if they perceive that the mirror is moving in a way that cannot be caused by a gravitational wave, they make it move back by, by pushing it a little bit. In the last mirror is pushed by just ordinary electrostatic forces. So they put, they put charge huh. on a mass sits, that sits behind the mirror to, to push it or pull it. A tiny, tiny <laughs> fraction. Okay. Okay? So, uh, wow. And my understanding is also that they measure the seismic activity by a different sensor. And then they, so they know already what is coming from Earth. And then they feed back it negatively to the system to compensate for this. Mm. And there are many, many of these control loops in the system, which makes it rather, rather uh, elaborate, I must say. Yeah. I see now why it's so expensive. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big, it's a huge project. Yeah. And th then we talked a little about, you remember we talked about this, the Weber had the signal. How did he know that this was the signal? Yeah, yeah. So do you know how they, how they figure out what is a signal today? No. So what they do is they simulate uh, many different possible events that they are expecting or could possibly happen. So my understanding is that they have a quarter of a million simulations of different kinds of gravitational waves uh, because gravitational waves can be caused by different cosmic uh, 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 events. Mm -hmm. You can have colliding black holes, you could have rotating binary stars, you could have a supernova. There are many different things that can redistribute mass in space. Yeah. So they have taken the different scenarios, let's call them, and of course you can have different size stars and different uh, rotational yeah. speeds, all this. And then they made many templates so that a typical signal would look something like this or another signal would look in, in a different way. And then when they, they continuously monitor the signal and see if the signal fits to one of the templates or not. And if it does, an alarm goes off, and then they have an additional, more sophisticated uh, detection algorithm that also checks the templates. Mm -hmm. And if that also uh, sounds the alarm, then they use the save the data. And then they do a very thorough an analysis and see if this could possibly be a gravitational wave. Of course, as I said, you need two instruments, and they have. So one is up in the northwest corner of the United States, and one is in the southeast or middle south of the United States. Yeah. And they must be operating at the same time, because otherwise you can never really be sure that the event was not caused by something else. Yeah. And then, because uh, they also managed to say now how like 
that this um, this thing that they measured in 2014, the first yeah. gravitational wave that yeah. they managed to measure, it was two black holes, right? Yeah, it was two black holes yeah. that sort of merged. Merged, yeah. And then they could, by having these, uh, that they had these calculations before, they could say that, okay, this corresponds to two black holes that has this and this math. Yeah. Uh, math, mass. Right? Yes, this yeah. is correct. This is correct. So in, in retrospect, they have then uh, provided the most likely explanation to what event caused this gravitational wave to be detected. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and this is done after careful analysis of the signal, the direction and, and the magnitude and frequency and all that. So when they, when they measure this, uh, this first gravitational wave in 2014, uh, how uh, they must have been uh, <laughs> happy. Did they know right away that this was, uh, that it was a right, correct signal, or do you know anything about the actual situation with the event? No, not so. I'm, I'm not directly involved, but, but uh, what I know is, of course, that the, the announcement that they had detected the gravitational wave took place long after the gravitational wave was detected. Mm. And meanwhile, they, of course, tried to exclude any other explanations and also did this analysis to try to explain what event it could have been. Mm. Okay? So uh, I think that uh, if you run these large facilities, and especially one like this where something happens that you have never seen before, uh, you must excise extreme caution in order not to announce prematurely that you have detected something that you later regret <laughs> that, uh, that you said, namely it was not what you thought. Yeah. Uh, so you may also know that LIGO is actually not the only gravitational wave on, on the planet. E gravitational wave detectors, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, but I don't know anything about the other ones though. I know they they exist. The, the, there are presently two other in operation, and one is called the Geo 600 in Germany, and it's a little bit smaller. It's the arms are only 600 meters, mm. and then there is another one in Italy, close to Pisa, uh, which has three kilometer arm lengths, and uh, recently these the, the three detectors, the two in the United States and uh, the one in Italy, they have been running together. Mm -hmm. And this is very advantageous because uh, if you have two detectors and, and you have an event that there is a small timing difference between, then you can say that, oh, the, the event must have been somewhere where the timing is, is exactly the one we measure, but, but there are many directions. So you get this sort of orange peel section of the sky uh, yeah. where the, the timing difference is the same to these two detectors. If you have a third detector, now you can pinpoint much better where in the sky this event must have happened. And this is what happened now in, in August. On August 17th, they detected, I think it was the fifth or sixth uh, gravitational wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and now all three detectors, the two LIGOs, and the Virgo, as the Italian is called, uh, detected it at once. And based on the three signals, their magnitudes and their re respective timing, they could pinpoint a very small area in the, in the sky where this event must have come from. So is this the event where they then uh, also could detect other types of signals? Exactly. Like electromagnetic? Yes, signals, right? yes, this is correct. So as soon as they had decided that, the, or believed that this was a gravitational wave, they called their colleagues who were observing in the optical or radio or microwave or gamma ray spectrum, asked them to point your telescopes, or if you have a telescope pointing in this direction, analyze the data and see if you see something. And they did, and they did. So now we have, since August, the first uh, evidence of simultaneous, how should I say, uh, gravitational uh, radiation and, and uh, electromagnetic radiation from some source. And, and this is believed to be two coalescing neutron stars. Wow. 
Oh, yeah, because they emit lots of different types of, uh, of uh, They radiation. do, yes, yes. And, and the electromagnetic radiation is emitted for a long time. The gravitational wave takes very little time. Do, do you know, by the way, how, how, how fast, how, how long such an event is? Uh, not, no. I know uh, how uh, uh, when, when a star dies and becomes a neutron star, I know how that, that that's uh, an event. Or, I mean, it takes basically forever. Or it's, it's different stages, of course, but that takes yeah. a long time. But, but I don't know of this kind of But this event. collision, it takes only a fraction of a, sec a second. Oh. Yeah, I, I, per personally, I have difficulty even understanding how two, two such big objects, which are rotating, yeah. can make several rotations around each other within a small fraction, about one third, a little bit more than one third of a second. They boom. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's the fascinating thing about this uh, space stuff. <laughs> like, it's the magnitudes of things. So that it's just yeah, it so is huge. fantastic, fantastic magnitudes. Yeah. And I, that, the, the other, I think, mind boggling thing is that this happened a billion years ago. And <laughs> only today we know it. With a fraction I mean, of a second. Yeah. <laughs> and now we see it. Yeah. Galactic news publishing is very slow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's, that's cool. So, but did it then uh, merge into another neutron star? Or yeah, this is what I understand. Yeah. Uh, but uh, at, the, at the same time, it shed a lot of, of um, energy in gravitational radiation, mm -hmm. equivalent to about the energy, the, the energy equivalent of three solar masses. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh. and this, is, this is an enormous, I mean, this is so much energy, you cannot even think about it. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I read somewhere that these kind of events, uh, the energy emitted from them is like more than all the energy that we can detect from the whole, all the stars in the sky, basically, or mm -hmm. all the, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's enormous. It's and yet the, the gravitational wave is so tiny, so tiny, tiny, tiny. Mm. Yeah. So now that they've successfully measured, what did you say, 506 uh, yeah. gravitational waves, uh, and these joint uh, measurements also yeah. with, the gra uh, with the gravitational waves and the electromagnetic radiation. Uh, what, what's the next step? Where we are? We, can they? Is it? Are we finished now? Uh, no, we're certainly not finished. Uh, I mean, we are at the beginning, I think, of a new uh, uh, era in astronomy, namely that now we will not only detect uh, electromagnetic radiation from from space. We are also going to detect uh, gravitational wave and see things that we cannot see. Perhaps mm -hmm. uh, you know that one of the mysteries in physics today is what what is all this uh, dark energy and where is all the missing mass. Yeah. Uh, According to the conventional model of, of gravity, uh, we cannot explain many things. And the only way to explain it is that there must be mass we don't see today. And what is this? So I believe that this is just the start of something. But more concretely, what is going to happen is that more nations are going to join this race or this uh, uh, measuring techniques. So the first one that I think will... We'll, uh, be up and running is they have a large detector, also a three kilometer one in, uh, in Japan. It's mm -hmm. called Kagra. Uh, the Ka comes from uh, Kamioka, which is uh, uh, a place in Japan where there's a mine. Maybe you, 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 you recognize the name uh, Kamiokande, this big neutron detector. Yeah. That got the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Yes. This was in the same mine, but okay. now they're going to use the mine to, to put the gravitational wave detector. And that it has two advantages to, uh, compared to LIGO, or Virgo, or DEO. Namely, it's underground, which means that the seismic noise is much less. Even though there's, because there's a lot of seismic activity in Japan. Uh, this is true, yeah. but, but still, the, the, the seismic activities, I think, mainly are in the low frequencies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and this is measuring at higher frequency, around 100 to 1,000 hertz. Uh, so uh, you get rid of lots of ground noise from cars and from waves and from, uh, from wind and so on, yeah. if you put it there. And second of all, they are going to cool this. So this is going to be cryogenic experiment, so they get rid of some of the thermal noise in the uh, gravitational wave antenna. Okay, and then they cool the 
mirrors. In my understanding is, yeah, you need to call the mirrors. And how they are going to do that, I, I, I cannot answer. I don't know today. But they had a smaller one. They have already tested, just like the initial LIGO. They had a, a, a previous one. It was called Tama 300. Mm -hmm. That was only 300 meters long. And it could certainly not detect gravitational waves. But yeah. this was built as a test for, for Kagra. Mm -hmm. uh, India is also joining the race. Uh, so there is a plan, but uh, still I think they have not even started to build it. A uh, gravitational wave detector that is going to be modeled on the LIGO mm. somewhere in India. Okay. Uh, so that is ground-based, but then one is also planning space-based antennas. How are we going to do kilometer-long arms in space? Uh, well, if you go up to space, you have no, gra or no gravity. <laughs> gravity is what you're going to measure. But, yeah. So you, you, you send it up. Uh, so you send up three satellites. And, and mostly up in space is vacuum. So you don't need to worry about vacuum and sound and, 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 and seismic noise. And so there are many noise sources that are not there. Okay. Space is also cool. So you don't have to cool things. Okay? So yeah. what they are sending up is three satellites. And so you have now three arms to measure. Oh, but do they connect them? No, physically? they can't. No, 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 no. They are going to be placed, I think, 1,200 kilometers apart. Okay. So the, 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 the arms are very long. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, how do they, how can they keep the di that distance exactly? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, maybe we don't know. No, no, I cannot tell you the, the, the details. This is, yeah. I, my answer would be very sophisticated engineering. But we have been doing space exploration for a long time, so uh, obviously uh, the space agencies can place things uh, very, very accurately. Mm. Okay? And again, I'm sure that there are going to be feedback loops and so on, so they monitor the distance and so on, and, so, and they see small detections. Mm. Uh, the, the advantage in space is now that since you don't have seismic noise, you can measure at much lower frequencies. Mm. And that means that you can see events that of, a dif of different types. Uh, they would not see these fast coalescence of black holes or, or neutron stars. They would see other events. Mm. So again, is, this is a sort of new observation window, but window not that it's not electromagnetic, but gravitation. It's, it's gravitation, but at lower frequencies, so yeah. slower events. Mm. But those are the two directions this field is moving towards. But of course, it's going to move a little bit slowly because it's so expensive to do this. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's also so that more and more, I think, individual nations are not going to be able to afford it. So this has to be based on international cooperation. And, and that, I think, is in itself very positive, but it also usually adds to time because you need to negotiate and who is doing what and, and, and so on and so forth. And is there also, uh, are they still trying to improve sensitivity and so on? I've oh, yeah, yeah, that. there is going to be, f f f with all likelihood, or I, 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 I can almost guarantee you that it will be a future LIGO. So mm -hmm. now they know even better how to improve sensitivity and, and, and what, to, what to do. And technology is constantly moving forward. So my guess is that the current LIGO is going to run for maybe a few more years, and then they stop it, and then they upgrade it. They don't need to build new tubes. They are already there. They're probably going to change the mirrors, maybe the corner station, probably the software, maybe some of the feedback, and so on and so forth. But, and, and then come, come back with an instrument, which is even better. And with each, this is something worth uh, keeping in mind. For each sensitivity improvement, by a factor of two, you can probe the space, a volume of space, which is eight, eight times larger. Okay. Uh, this, this has simply to do with dimensions. Yeah, so yeah. you can probe twice as, as far in this direction, twice as far in this, and twice as far in that. So that means that, yeah. So it means that you can see eight times more events mm. than before. So each little improvement is actually worth a lot. Cool. Yeah, I've, I've heard since I'm in the quantum optics field, there is there has been discussions on if one could use like quantum states of life, like squeeze the, states. To the, this is one improvement they are going to, 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 to make, I'm sure. Yeah. So you can you can engineer. So what you don't think about is that even in empty space, 
where you have no light and it's absolutely cold, you still have electromagnetic fluctuations. Mm. And they, you can trace them back to Heisenberg's uncertainty relation. That the, the electromagnetic field can actually not to stand still or be in the ground state completely. Um, and, and these tiny, tiny fluctuations actually sneak in the back way in this interferometer. And now you can engineer it such that you can reduce uh, them where, where you're measuring. And, and it's going to be, be used. And my, my personal belief is that, yeah, maybe you with a factor of two. And it doesn't sound much. Yeah. But you can, well, first of all, it gives you eight times more events that you can see. And second of all, you can look at the alternatives. Yeah, you could build eight kilometer long arms. Okay, how much would that cost? <laughs> or have uh, how, how, or how you high can laser, laser power was it? Yeah, in each arm you have 20, 75 kilowatts of power. You could yeah. try to double that. That would also give you a factor of two improvement. Yeah. But then you have other challenges. Especially then you, yeah, yeah. They, so it comes, it comes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, every improvement, of course, comes with its, its, its own problems in some senses. So, so there is always a compromise. Okay, I think we've been talking for quite a while now. We should maybe start to round this off. Uh, but it's been really interesting talk. I learned a lot, and it's going to be interesting to follow the Nobel celebrations now and the upcoming week. Uh, so thank you so much for, for being here and uh, talking about the LIGO and the gravitational waves. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. <laughs>